Hello, my name is Fergal McKinney and I'm head of British Heart Foundation Northern Ireland. Um, welcome to today's event, which is about atrial fibrillation or AF for short. AF occurs when electrical impulses fire in a disorganized way in the atria, that's the top chambers of the heart. And AF is one of the most common types of abnormal heart rhythm. Around 1.3 million people in the UK have been diagnosed with AF, and it's thought that another half a million people have it, but have not been diagnosed yet. So AF can increase, increase the risk of a blood clot forming inside the heart. If the clot is swept up out of the heart and into the blood vessels of the brain, that can cause a stroke. Uh, so since the British Heart Foundation was founded in 1961, we've come a very long way in improving the lives of people with abnormal heart rhythms, from understanding the electrical pathways to improving treatments. We have much to be proud of, but the job is not yet complete. We currently support over 16 million pounds of life-saving research into atrial fibrillation across the UK. And by improving our understanding of AF and finding new ways to treat it, fewer people will be at risk of heartbreak from a stroke. And if you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you've probably got a lot of questions. You may be wondering about the severity of your condition and your prognosis. And, you know, it's absolutely normal to experience a range of emotions at this time, including uncertainty, fear, anxiety, low mood, but at the BHF, we are here to help. Our heart helpline is open weekdays, nine to five. Our nurses are here for you, just a call or a click away. So before I introduce our speakers, we've got a poll question for you. And that poll question is, how would you rate your understanding of atrial fibrillation? So it's a one to five figure, as you can see, um, and uh, that's, one for very little and five a lot. So if you could answer that poll, we'd be grateful. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers now. And uh, we're joined by Professor Chris Gale, uh, Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and BHF funded research at the University of Leeds, who will talk about his research into atrial fibrillation. Before that, we are uh, joined, we will be joined and delighted to be joined by Mike Matthews, who will tell us what it's like living with atrial fibrillation. We'll also be joined by Joanne Whitmore, senior cardiac nurse at the BHF, for the question and answer session, which will follow. And remember, you can post your questions in the question and answer function, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. But for now, I'm delighted to hand over to Mike Matthews, who will talk about living with atrial fibrillation. I think you're on mute, Mike. That's you. Beg your pardon, start again. Um, hello. Um, I thought I'd talk about um, plumbing and um, uh, or atrial fibrillation, but dealing with my family to start off with. Um, we've had problems with plumbing and a fuse box. My mother had um, had an irregular heartbeat. Um, perhaps we thought it was AF, but it was never treated. But she always complained of it. Uh, my sister, a, a retired matron who's been nursing since she was the age of 18 in Somerset, had Wolf Parkinson White syndrome in the 1970s. At, at that time, it was very rare. And I believe the only place they could um, treat it was the Hammersmith Hospital. She had an ablation in 1994, and then um, AF in 2015, and further ablations in 2019. Um, she's still in AF, the same as me. <clears throat> My father had... Um, an abdominal and aortic aneurysm. Um, and my brother, uh, a PhD speech therapist in New Zealand now, had problems with his aorta. I've got a couple of daughters. One's a special needs teacher with endometriosis and functional neurological disorder 
And my youngest one is just about to qualify as a midwife, but she also has endometriosis and a couple of other things, of which um, her heart is probably one of them. Um, as for me, I've worked since I was 12, um, not up the chimneys or anything like that, um, but I was stacking shelves um, and paper rounds and things like that. Um, and I don't knowingly um, think I've drawn any, any unemployment benefits since. I've had nine different careers, including a musician, a bandsman with the Queen's Royal Irish Hazards. Um, I was a sales rep, I've been a housing officer, and for the last 20 years of my working life, I worked for Dorset Probation in the Community Service Unit. However, thanks to Chris Grayling, you remember him? Um, he's the guy that dismantled the probation service. Um, so I retired um, seven years ago. I still work now. Um, uh, I'm uh, short, well, just a few weeks short of my 70th birthday. Um, I look after 25 flats for retired musicians, artists, authors, and other people in the arts, um, about 25 miles away from here. I've had chest pains for years, um, even when I served in the military uh, as a musician. Um, and I remember going to my MO at the time, I was stationed in Germany for 10 years, um, about the site of chest pains. Um, and I just wanted to know whether it was anything to do with my heart. He said, no, he says, not, not that. He said, it's the wrong side and just dismissed it. Um, I, I mentioned I was in, in uh, Germany. I have to say that the biggest highlight for me in my military service was the Queen's Silver Jubilee. I mean, we've just gone through the platinum one. Uh, well, I was there on the 7th of the 7th, 77 in Germany with 740 musicians. Um, and it was a big parade, a big, big, big parade. Um, we had weeks and weeks of kit inspections, um, checking everything, that our shoes were bright and shiny, that everything was pressed tight, everything was immaculate. Um, but what they did, they, they dropped us off at six o'clock in the morning at Zennerlager. If any, anybody um, who's watching this at the moment, um, been in the army, they will have known Zennerlager. Um, anyway, we'd be there at six o'clock and it was in the middle of the heath and it was sand and rubbish and all sorts. The Queen, um, she left Buckingham Palace at 20 past eight. So we were there for two, and, two hours and 20 minutes before she even left house. And then she had to fly to Germany. Anyway, uh, it was in the army. I did a um, fair bit of sport. Um, I played squash. Um, and also hammer thrower. I was a hammer thrower. Um, I broke my leg um, throwing it, the body turned, uh, but my leg didn't. Uh, I was walking on it for a day um, without, well, I did know because it hurt a lot, but, um, and we'd only just qualified as medics. All of us have qualified as medics, but I came back from the um, athletics field and my boss got me into a, a two fire buckets of water, one hot and one cold, dip it, hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, it did nothing. And, um, and it was only the next day I went sick and um, I ended up in hospital. And because I'd walked on it so much, um, they couldn't do anything. And I, I was bedridden for 10 days before they could even put a plaster of Paris on. As a family, I'm not sure that we've been dealt with a full pack regarding health. But anyway, we're still here. One thing I would say though, is that I, I don't, well, perhaps you've judged already, I don't take life too seriously. Um, I just get on with it really. Um, I found out that I had um, atrial fibrillation. I, it was the day after Boxing Day, about 2006, maybe five. Um, and I was going, I was due to go to Exmoor to my parents' place to give them their Christmas presents. And, um, but I went to the gym. And so I got on, uh, um, on the uh, um, cross trainer and you got the arm things and I'm pulling backwards and forwards and cycling as well. And um, they had heart centers, sensors on these things. And um, 
I just look, I, heart rate was just all over the place, 120, 180, 60, 40, 190, 210. Um, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, I wasn't feeling quite right. So I thought, well, I'll go on the bike. At least I can sit down. Um, and so exactly the same thing. I've got my hand on these um, heart sensors and, um, and it's all over the place, still all over the place. Um, so I wasn't feeling too clever, but it was cold outside. So I thought I'll pop in the sauna. Nothing can go wrong in there. And um, of course, the temperature in there was about 110 degrees and I wasn't there for very long and uh, thumping away like a good one. So I called um, my GP surgery and um, as with luck, it was open and I went to see them straight away. And the GP that I saw, never seen before, um, he just tested and he said, well, probably everything's all right. You've got low blood pressure and, and whatever. And anyway, came back a few minutes later and uh, rushing in, he said, he said, I think there's more than that. He said, um, uh, because you suffer from high blood pressure, you probably got um, heart block. Uh, so we called an ambulance. And um, as I mentioned, I was due to go to Exmoor to my parents to take their Christmas presents. Um, so I went out in the car park and uh, was um, just on the phone to her and, uh, and saying that um, I, I can't come up, I can't come up. And I could hear these two tones of something that was getting nearer and nearer and uh, until it pulled into the car park, which came as a big surprise that it was actually for me. I, um, um, anyway, my mother said, she said well, what's that noise? Uh, I said, don't worry, it's, it's a fire engine, but I'll talk to you later on. Um, I come from a small village on Exmoor, um, actually just a few miles from the prime minister's house uh, and their farm where they live. Uh, I have to say that my hair is a bit like his today, but thankfully that's where the similarity stops. Anyway, I was taken um, by this ambulance, well, not blue lighted anyway, <clears throat> to uh, Dorchester Hospital. And um, of course, because it's the week between Christmas and New Year, um, basically the hospital was closed. There was not much I could, um, they could do, or I could do, or they could do, because um, it wouldn't do any tests. Um, so I had to wait until um, the first couple of days in January before they do an echo and do other tests and things like that. Uh, and that's when they confirmed that atrial fibrillation. Um, I'd not heard of it before at all. It was all new to me. Um, then uh, I went to uh, back a couple of months later for a cardio version, my first one, my first jump start. And um, so I'm there, but just before I went, uh, my, my daughter who was still at school at the time, shares my humour, um, said, well, what are they going to do? And I said, well, as far as I know, I think they're going to stop it and start it again. And she sort of pondered and she said, well, what happens if you have a power cut after they've stopped it? Um, so anyway, just left it at that, really. Um, but even then, when I was there in the, in the um, uh, surgery unit, day unit, um, I didn't take it too seriously then because um, I asked the doctor who was just about to do the deed and I said, is, it, um, is this a bit like casualty? Will I move? Oh, she said, yeah, you'll, you'll move. You'll move all right. And I said, yeah, but you know, I'm not going to move like that. Oh, she said, you'll move. Um, I said, but that's a lot of artistic license there. I said, it's got to be like casualty, isn't it? No, she said, just like, it's, it's, it's like casualties, she said, but without the cameras. Um, would, would, would they like me to film it? I said, no, 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 thank you. No, that's fine. Over the following years, um, I had another five cardioversions and three ablations. Um, the first ablation um, where it was a, a success. And, um, uh, but the trouble is that when I got home, there, there was a, I had a hematoma, which was grew and grew and grew. And it was actually quite, quite a size, a hematoma in my groin. And this was the site where they, um, uh, the entry site for the stent, sorry, for the stent for the catheter. 
Um, and um, it was, uh, I got home and it was, went to see my GP because it was quite painful. And he just said, well, put your leg up, that'll be all right. But it was not particularly helpful. But the following day I called the hospital and, and, um, and said that um, I got this, this problem and they admitted me for two or three days and stuck a compression pad on my, on this hematoma. It was a bit like a, I don't know, like a big pad thing, really. Almost like a potato ricer, I thought. Um, the longest I've been in sinus rhythm is uh, about six months. Um, and I know that um, every time I had a cardioversion, it was always um, um, about 240 joules, I think they said. And of course, when I did see, um, casualty just a, a few weeks later and they said you know charge to 80 joules I said oh is that all <laughs> um I returned to AF twice when I I took up yoga and I thought well that'll be all right that'll be good for me um I took up this yoga and I went and on two sessions I was there and uh, and I could feel it and I could feel it go out and um, it was always must feel quite bad in the, in the throat, but I was—I mean, I was fine. I was okay, but I knew knew jolly well that it was um, it was out. It also went at a time when Princess Anne was due to come and visit us. Um, I was um, uh, in charge of a of a, of a an arm of um, our community service unit where we were training offenders to. Um, get an education degree or education qualifications and also an engineering certificate. So they work on tanks at the Tank Museum in Bobbington in the morning and then do uh, literacy and numeracy in the afternoon. And um, 160 people went through. We only had two that failed um, that came back, uh, which is actually quite good because normal recidivism rate was about 40%. Anyway, uh, Princess Anne was there and um, she was having a tour around and uh, one guy said to her, said, um, Jimmy said, I'm really grateful to your mum. Oh, yes. Yeah. She said, why is that? I said, well, she allowed me to stay in one of her prisons for six years, uh, six months last year. And jolly nice it was. Um, when I came, uh, came out of um, Dorchester to start off with, I was placed on amiodarone. Uh, it was described as a dirty drug, and I think I was on there for about seven or eight years, I think. Um, it, was a, it wasn't quite the nicest of drugs because um, headlights in cars and things, and we get all these star lights and things. And also sunburn was a, was a big problem as well. But now I'm on bisoprolol and warfarin. Um, I can't have any of the other sort of uh, recent drugs for blood thinning because of uh, other conditions that I have. I'm in permanent AF. Um, I have good days and bad days, still get chest pains. Um, uh, my beta, beta blockers slow me down a bit um, and also slows the heart down, so it's quite good. Unfortunately, there's quite a bit of me. Um, I've been on diet since I was 12. Um, and if I'd never gone on one, I, I think that um, I would probably still be overweight, but I'd probably be about four or five stone lighter. It's the yo-yo effect, and it's um, and that's what's happened to me in uh, well the last fifty-eight years since I was twelve. Um, of course, lockdown didn't help, um, and to me, um, uh, AF is a is a hindrance. I don't think it's a well, it is a real illness, but I've lived it with it for many years, and it's not particularly troubled me. Um, the worst part, I have to say, is tinnitus. Um, I've got tinnitus in my left ear um, and I sleep on my left side and I can hear the misbeats, um, which really annoy me when I'm trying to get to sleep at night. So now I keep my radio on all night. Um, I still go to the gym and I still cycle. Um, but I prefer that to running, can't stand running. Um, however, I had a an accident um, actually three days before lockdown in 2020 uh, when I got knocked off my bike um, by a car pulling out of a side road. Um, and that brings me here <coughs> to today. So um, 
Um, thanks for listening. I'm, I'm sorry I may have gone on a bit too long. I can talk for the world really at times, but I'll pass you back to Fergal. Thank you. Mike, uh, thank you very much indeed. And you were really indebted to you for sharing your story. And I love that your humour come it's interlaced through it and it tells me something about how you're dealing with your condition and of course you reflected it on the end but just to say we're indebted and thank you very much indeed so as i said earlier uh, we're now joined by professor chris gale who's a professor of cardiovascular medicine at the university of leeds who will talk about his research into atrial fibrillation chris Thank you, Fergal. And it, and it really is a, a great pleasure to be able to just present so, some of our uh, research that's been funded by uh, the British Heart Foundation, and we're indebted to the British Heart Foundation and to the public. Um, uh, to all of you who are listening, you know, th this, this is what counts. This is what you're um, helping um, us achieve. So I want to just give you some, some gentle insights in, into what we've been doing in terms of atrial fibrillation research at the University of Leeds with my team. Um, I, I'm a consultant cardiologist. I'm professor of cardiovascular medicine um, at the university and at Leeds General Infirmary. Um, so let me just go on to the next slide here. So atrial fibrillation, what is it? Well, Mike has given a really good story, his journey through atrial fibrillation. And, and, and I suppose that's the perspective that I need to understand as well. I don't have atrial fibrillation. Um, but I need to understand it from others' perspective. But what I see from a cardiologist's point of view, and what I want to explain to you today about atrial fibrillation, is, is two, two things on this slide, really, is that it actually is really common, okay? We, we think there are well over a million people in the UK that have atrial fibrillation, and there's probably a third of a million who are undetected and undiagnosed, maybe more. It's the commonest heartbeat or heart rhythm abnormality. And what is it? If you look at the, plot, the, the schematics, the diagrams there, the, the one that says normal is, shows the route of the electricity through the heart. And it goes down specific pathways or channels or wires or whatever you want to, uh, to think about. But it goes down specific routes across the chambers and into the main pumping chambers of the heart. And the electricity essentially activates the muscle and the muscle then squeezes and throws out the blood that goes around the body. And that we can see on an ECG, the bottom squiggles there. There's what we call a normal electrical pathway, a normal sinus rhythm. Now the schematic on the right with all those crazy lines is what's happening in the top chambers of the heart. That's the atria, where they're just chaotic. I tend to say they're a little bit like rebellious teenagers. Whatever you want them to do, they do something different. Uh, and, and they're all over the place. Um, so they're firing off the electrical activity from different parts and different areas, and those atria are really quite chaotic and random in their contraction. Thankfully, there's a natural braking pathway um, to allow the heartbeat and the electricity to activate into the big pumping chambers. But nonetheless, what we tend to see is an irregular heartbeat, and the bottom tracing there shows this irregularity of those spikes, those big spikes, they occur at unpredictable times. And sometimes it can go really fast, and sometimes it can go really slow, and sometimes it can actually go back to a normal rhythm and then go back to an irregular heartbeat. So it can be quite frustrating, both for the patient, but also for the clinician who's trying to treat it. One of the major problems with, um, uh, uh, with, with atrial fibrillation is that it conveys quite a, a high risk of stroke. That's one of the major concerns that we have at the moment. Whilst it can cause uh, palpitations and symptoms, one of the issues here is, is of stroke and stroke prevention. So we undertook a large, over a decade study, which collected lots of information from our health records in the country that are routinely collected. And what we found and what we showed was over time, from about 2006, the incidence, that means that the number of accounts of people who had been hospitalized with stroke because of atrial fibrillation was on the upturn. It increased dramatically. And this coincided with the increase in number of people detected and diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. But as you can see, the top line goes up 
it plateaus and then starts to come down. And the reason why it comes down, the number of strokes come down, is because we're prescribing nowadays the appropriate oral anticoagulation, the blood thinning tablet that prevents or reduces your risk of stroke. And thereafter, we, we, we can see quite clearly that if we diagnose atrial fibrillation, if we give people the right medication who are eligible to it, we can save lives, prevent strokes, and reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease at scale, so throughout the whole NHS. And this can save huge amounts of money and stress and strain for everyone involved. So uh, what I want to uh, um, convey across to you is that actually intelligence, what I mean data intelligence, information is really, really important. We need to know in our country, in the NHS, how well we're doing. We need to be able to quantify the burden of disease so that we can target our strategies for treatment and new treatment and new research to reduce that burden. And so the BHF funded us as part of a wider project to do some data gathering and some analysis with my team. And what we did is we linked primary care, so your GP records, um, through to electronic health records uh, um, that, uh, for admissions to hospital. And we downloaded this data, anonymized, de-identified, completely uh, uh, um, uh, um, de-identified, that related to well over 3 million people in England who had seen their GP over the last 20 years. So large data sets, you know, unparalleled with other countries in the world. And, and we extracted information about those patients with atrial fibrillation and compared them with those without. And what we wanted to do is look at the burden. That means that, um, the amount of atrial fibrillation that we're witnessing at the moment and had witnessed over time. And what we found is that we describe it as incidents. That's the new people, the new cases of atrial fibrillation over time had increased and it had increased dramatically probably by about 70 or more percent and indeed the narrative now is that we believe that atrial fibrillation outstrips the combined instance of four of the most common cancers in in the country so it's a huge burden and it's not just a burden because of the symptoms of palpitations. It's a burden because of the healthcare costs and the stress and strain that it ensues through stroke. So why is it increasing? Well, we found that it's increasing probably for a number of reasons. Firstly, we know that the population is aging. As you get older, you're more likely to have atrial fibrillation. Also, because people are now generally more comorbid. And finally, is because we're detecting more atrial fibrillation in the old days, we weren't really sh uh, sure about uh, detecting it and what to do with it. So it wasn't top of our priorities. What this plot shows is that over time, the people who are diagnosed with new atrial fibrillation are more comorbid. That means they have other conditions in addition to the atrial fibrillation. So across quite a number of conditions here, cardiovascular and respiratory and cancers, but also one of the driving factors here beyond age is hypertension. So high blood pressure, which should be now be checked and treated, is one of the driving factors uh, for atrial fibrillation and is on the upturn. We also found um, that uh, atrial fibrillation disproportionately affects men and women and in slightly different ways, depending on how you split the data. Generally, we found that women who had new diagnoses of atrial fibrillation were typically much older. Uh, Chris, then, can, I just, can I just interrupt for two uh -huh, seconds? Yeah. Your sound is just fading. It had been a bit poor, but it's just faded a little bit more. Let me try Maybe that. Maybe just try going off um, earphones, uh, and let's see if that makes any difference. Sorry for it, interrupting it, you. Is that, is that better? Can you hear me better now? I think I, so, yeah, yeah. 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 So a, atrial fibrillation now tends to uh, occur in women who tend to be more older and in men 
at a younger age. Uh, and that's interesting because people tend to worry whether uh, atrial fibrillation is a male disease or a female disease. It affects both sexes, but at slightly different ages. Men younger and women older. We also looked at where and who and what what we call class of patient gets new atrial fibrillation. And not unsurprisingly, we found that those who are what we call underserved, those who are socioeconomically uh, compromised in the lower quintiles are more likely to have atrial fibrillation. They're also more likely to be comorbid, have other illnesses. And more recently, they're more likely to be diagnosed at a much younger age. So these are really important insights into how we can potentially target and therefore treat patients with atrial fibrillation. So uh, before I move on to the next part of the talk, I just want to suggest that the implications here are, are that atrial fibrillation is becoming the forefront, but historically our attention has been on what we call ischemic heart disease, so heart attacks and coronary artery disease, and even heart failure. But clearly we've shown here that atrial fibrillation is on the upturn. It's a huge population burden, and it's where we should be targeting our, our, our um, uh, uh, strategies, really. And, and clearly our data has shown that there are potential opportunities for what we call more targeted strategies for prevention and resource allocation. And I'll just go into that for a moment now. Currently, the NHS and the government support the identification of atrial fibrillation. They acknowledge that it is a problem and it's in the long-term government plan. The recommendations at the moment are that you present to your GP with whatever ailment it is and your GP does an opportunistic pulse check. They check your pulse when you turn up to the surgery and they see if it's a normal heartbeat or an irregular one and that may well then generate a cascade of investigations. The problem with that is that only a less than half of people who should be going to their normal checkups don't turn up. So we're missing out more than half of the patients for an opportunistic check. And indeed, when we've looked at randomized controlled trials, the scientific way of analyzing that, it's not really an efficient way of detecting atrial fibrillation. The other way you could potentially do uh, identify atrial fibrillation is you screen the whole population. So 66 million people in, in England, Wales, and Scotland, all right, we, we screen them all. The problem with that is it's quite burdensome and not everyone would need to be screened and it's not really cost effective. Indeed, the yield from that, when it's been studied in other places, is really quite low and people tend not to turn up to screening. So it's not supported in the UK. So what's the alternative? Well, I'm very pleased to say that the British Heart Foundation have supported us in our Find AF program of work. And that's, uh, Find AF is the future innovations in novel detection of atrial fibrillation. And here what we want to do is capitalize on our expertise in data and data analysis and the amount of data, the rich data that we have got in the UK uh, to develop a targeted approach to the identification of patients who are at high risk of atrial fibrillation. So a preventative strategy through targeted identification. So what we have done is we have um, tapped into the primary care records for millions of people and developed an algorithm, an algebra algor uh, algorithm, to predict who is at the highest risk of getting new atrial fibrillation in the next few months. And we can do that with really quite good accuracy and predictability. And we've shown that in terms of the numerics. And what we want to do now is, um, and th through our learnings with uh, in the NHS, through how we coped through COVID in terms of doing digital uh, uh, diagnostics and treatment, is to take that back to the public now through a digital transformation pathway. So we've designed a pathway where we can implement this algorithm, this special AI algorithm, 
into general practices to identify who in that practice potentially ha is going to get atrial fibrillation such that remotely we can invite those patients to receive a technology, a very easy to use technology that we'll post out to patients to diagnose or refute the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And if you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, we'll no notify you and your GP and offer some recommendations. If you're not at high risk of AF, clearly you won't go into the pathway for the diagnostic device and you'll just carry on with your normal care with your GP. So all of this can be done from your sitting room at home without having to go to see your GP. Uh, and that's what we plan to implement through the BHF funding. So let me just summarize for a second or two, because I know I've talked for some time. AF is really common, and the number of cases are now increasing. We know it disproportionately affects us by our age, our sex, and our socioeconomic status. Really importantly, we know that stroke for many people, uh, AF for many people, confers a high risk of stroke. And that can be that risk can be reduced and strokes can be prevented with really easy therapies. The problem is that there are so many people who just have atrial fibrillation or at high risk of atrial fibrillation, yet don't know about it and are undiagnosed and undetected. And at the moment, the government and the evidence doesn't support screening. We want to challenge that and do a targeted identification pathway, which has now been funded by the British Heart Foundation. And hopefully, if it's successful, we'll save the NHS lots of money and we'll prevent strokes and diagnose people earlier so they can live better lives. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave it there. Chris, thank you very much indeed. That was a fascinating talk, and I just love that idea of the technology coming into that space in the middle between, you know, mass um, assessment and uh, you know and, and what we have at, at the present. So, congratulations on your work and uh, and for the journey ahead. I'm sure there's plenty of different dynamics involved in that journey as well. And of course, thank you to Mike. Uh, two. So now two question and answers. I'd like to introduce Leanne Gresh as the question and answer moderator, and she'll be asking pre-submitted questions first and then live questions. And of course, as I said earlier, we're uh, also joined by Joanne Whitmore, who's a senior cardiac nurse at the BHF. Leanne. Thanks, Fergal, and thanks, Mike and Chris, for, for the great talks. I'll, I'll jump straight into the questions because we've received a lot of questions. The first one um, to you, um, Chris, Professor Gale. Um, the question is, can permanent AF ever just go away? It's a, it's a great question. So um, by definition, permanent atrial fibrillation is permanent. Sometimes we get that definition wrong and it can disappear. There are a number of types of AF depending on its duration and its frequency. So it can be persistent, which means it just lasts for a certain amount of time before we decide what to do with it and try and revert it to a normal rhythm or make it permanent. There's paroxysmal which is where the AF switches on and off from a normal rhythm to atrial fibrillation. And there's permanent, where we decide that actually the atrial fibrillation is long lasting and is going to stay as it is. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Joanne, thank you for joining us today. It's great to have someone from the cardiac team join us today. And so the question is, can anxiety and panic attacks cause atrial fibrillation? That's uh, another great question um, and oh, could be quite a long reply, but I think I'll stick to um, two angles. I think um, that the, the, the person that's asking the question is trying to get at. So the first, um, I think probably from a scientific perspective, there are some studies that can show a possible association between anxiety um, disorders and, and AF. Um, and what this does, it, it, what these studies are showing is that it might create a favorable environment for AF. However, the studies are very um, are limited, so they're not robust enough, they're not big enough, so that there are, there are flaws within them. So we can't say definitively that anxiety and panic attacks cause AF, but they are posing some other questions. And I think, you know, some very relevant questions in terms of um, angles to look at um, if we treat um, anxiety well um, with people does that have an impact on their AF so there's lots of interesting um, aspects from a scientific research side um, point of view 
in terms of practicality, um, AF is a frustrating annoying condition that comes when comes and goes and comes when you don't want it to and that can cause stress and anxiety as well so I'd, I just think in terms of um, trying to manage that aspect of it when you're not sure if it's an, a panic attack anxiety or whether it's it's you know the AF itself I think probably knowledge is power that's probably the best tip I can can give you so understand your condition understand your AF what your, your trigger factors may be um, you know what works for you to um, to help you relax and you know it's, it, is it AF is it panic attack so really get to understand what um, how your AF works for you because it, it's different with lots of different people um, but there's also the anxiety side and the panic attack side as well and it, it's about you know understanding that that condition also so I would certainly encourage people to seek support for that um we do have uh, an emotion emotional well-being hub on our website which you, you'll find some useful information and links on um the nhs have great resources for um you know anxiety panic attacks etc um so yeah j you know just just search out and find answers and know your conditions well is, is what i'd say thanks joanne that's, that's really helpful and um, another one for you, does high blood pressure cause AF? Well, as you've heard already about um, the association between high blood pressure and, and atrial fibrillation, so it, it doesn't necessarily cause AF per se, but your risk of getting atrial fibrillation increases if you do have hypertension, if you do have a high blood pressure. So that's why they're often seen together. Um, there are also lots of other risks to um, to atrial fibrillation, age being you know the, the, the biggest one, which you've heard about already. Other things are um, already if you've already got coronary heart disease, um, valve disease, obesity, um, you know lung problems, and also sort of some drug and alcohol misuse um, can make you more likely to to get um, to develop AF. Thank you, and um, Professor Gale, we've got a couple for you now. So the question is, how does paroxysmal AF differ from continuous AF? Paroxysm just means it's on and off, um, really, uh, and um, permanent or continuous AF is there all the time. Now, um, for, for, for both types of AF, the on and off, the paroxysmal and the permanent, uh, and depending on your risk factors, both have equal uh, risk of stroke, and, uh, and that's really important. In the old days, we thought that on and off AF wasn't quite as important as the permanent atrial fibrillation in terms of stroke prevention, but we now know it is. And the crucial thing here is if you're high risk, and we use a scoring system uh, that you receive oral anticoagulation if you wish to do so. Um, so so, so the, the, those are the important differences in terms of the outcomes. In terms of the symptoms, some people don't get any symptoms at all when they have atrial fibrillation. They're the fortunate ones in a way. Um, the, the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation really can be quite frustrating for patients as it can for the doctors and the nurses trying to treat it. Uh, and that's because sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. And it's unpredictable as to when you're going to get it. And if the symptoms are palpitations or chest pains or breathlessness, they can really be quite intrusive. Now, Sometimes, um, following treatments, pharmacotherapies, tablets, uh, we can decide whether it's appropriate to go inside the heart and try and find that naughty electrical um, focus, that area uh, that's triggering the atrial fibrillation, and try and burn it or freeze it away. Uh, and, and that's called uh, um, pulmonary, pulmonary vein isolation uh, therapy. And we do that in some cases, predominantly people who have this on and off paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who are quite symptomatic uh, from it and, and have been through tablet therapy. But it's not always suitable for everyone. And another one, how do symptoms of angina differ from atrial fibrillation? Wow, okay. Um, well, the typical, I shouldn't say typical, but the classical symptoms of angina are what we call exertional dependent chest pain. So when you demand more of your body, um, the pipes that feed the blood to the heart, which aren't as clear and pristine as they should be, because they've furred up, can't supply that blood to the muscle, the heart muscle, and therefore you get heart pains and angina. That's typically what happens. It's exertional dependent. 
Whereas atrial fibrillation can occur at any old time. It can be there all the time. And sometimes that uh, and can cause not necessarily chest pains, but more often palpitations, thudding, uh, pal uh, um, a feeling of breathlessness when you exert yourself. Having said that, there are always disclosures and, 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 uh, 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 um, uh, and clauses around that because we know nowadays that angina can present in lots of different ways, not necessarily with chest pain. Equally, atrial fibrillation can present with chest pain. Um, so it, it can be a difficult one, uh, but there are some classical differences. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, Joanne, back, back to you. It's a really good question. Can you exercise with AF? If so, what is a safe level of exercise? I think that's that's a great question. It is, yeah, it is. And, and Mike did touch on it in his um, in his talk. Well, both Professor Gale and Mike. Um, Mike, you do a, a, great, a great amount of exercise. So it, it, it's good to see. So in general, um, and for the vast, vast majority of people, yes, you, you know, you, you can exercise with AF. We would um, always just say, um, check with your healthcare professional whether it be GP or your nurse or whoever first of all to make sure that there's nothing um, to say that you can't exercise or that you can only do a certain level of exercise um, but once you've been given that go ahead um, you know it, there will be lots of things that it's, it would depend on um, what your previous exercise levels were like Do you know so if you were a fit and healthy person beforehand um, you know your exercise starting level I guess would be um, higher than somebody who's not done any exercise so even if you've not done exercise previously you, you know if you've been diagnosed with AF it's a good idea to consider starting to do some exercise and take that easy you know like I said check with your GP but just small amounts of um, exercise it could be housework it could be gardening you know just 10 minute um, bouts of, of just getting your heart rate up a little bit to start with to see how you go um, would be you know would probably be advisable the important thing if you do get any symptoms if you don't feel right if you feel dizzy you're getting unduly breathless um stop and and have a rest um it is quite individual and there are lots of people now who do sort of want to know more um specific um levels of exercise um and it, it's very difficult when you don't know somebody um but, you know, I, I would certainly have a chat with your GP and try and find some local support um, that can support, you, you know, maybe with the exercise level you, to help you put a plan together, maybe see if there's services like that locally. But in short, yes, um, the answer is that you can exercise. The safe level um, varies between different different people. But in general, you know, exercise is safe for everybody with atrial fibrillation, unless there's a caveat that, um, you know, it, Professor Gale might want to, to, to chat about. I'm not sure. No, I, I think I think that's right, um, Joe. Um, it, what, what we do know is from some randomised evidence is that if you do follow a healthy lifestyle that involves um, uh, exercise, if you've got atrial fibrillation, it tends to help. Um, and, and certainly, it shouldn't prevent you from doing exercise. But if you reverse it the other way around. I don't think by doing more and more and more vigorous exercise, you'll cure yourself of atrial fibrillation. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't stop you doing it. The, the only issue is that the top chambers of the heart, those naughty teenagers that are rebellious, really are, are quite important um, chambers of the heart because they top up the bottom chambers of the heart. And if you lose that because they're chaotic contraction, we say we, you lose the atrial kick. So the kick, the extra topping up of the cylinders of the heart are lost, and therefore you don't have as much go in the engine. Thanks, thanks, Chris. And there's a question as well that's really, I think it would be good to, to have an answer to this one, is it whether a patient is still considered to have AF after having a pacemaker fitted? That's it's a interesting question, isn't it? Is that, is that to me or Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah, once you've got atrial fibrillation, you've really always got atrial fibrillation is my motto, I'm afraid. And that's because I, I what, what I don't like to see is people coming back with a stroke who've stopped their anticoagulation because they think they've been cured. Um, so if you have a pacemaker, it's usually because your heartbeat is slow. And as I mentioned earlier, your, in atrial fibrillation, the heartbeat can go sometimes really quite fast. Sometimes it can go at a normal steady away heartbeat, albeit irregular, and sometimes it can really go quite slowly. Now, 
typically we put in standard pacemakers because the heart rate is going slowly. Not always because of atrial fibrillation. You can have a reason for a pacemaker that's not atrial fibrillation, but typically it's because of a slow heart rate. If you've got atrial fibrillation as well, those top chambers are still doing um, what they shouldn't be doing, which is contracting in a sinus regulated heartbeat. So they're still fibrillating and that offers a stroke risk through a clot forming in those chambers and then potentially um, uh, breaking off and going to the head. So there always is potentially underlying atrial fibrillation despite a regulated programmed heartbeat through a pacemaker. Thanks, Rose. Back, back to you, Joanne. I know that Professor Gale already talked about the difference of enjoying and atrial fibrillation, but another question that has come in is about the difference between AF and atrial flutter. So what, what is the difference there? Okay. So at AF, you've heard it being described a number of times today as chaotic, and you, you've seen the diagram that Professor Gale showed, the, the, the erraticness of, of atrial fibrillation. With atrial flutter, um, the atria still beats very rapidly, but it beats um, very regularly. So it, it's what it does, the atria fires off um, these beats, but it's doing it very, very quickly. So it's, it's about 300 beats a minute that it does. Where the AV node, so from, from the atria, it goes down and the ventricles are here, it passes through a, at the AV node. Now what um, the AV node, node does with atrial flutter, or, or what, what that part of the heart does, it only lets so many through. So it will let every one in three through or every one in four through. So it's a bit like a polling, you know, a, a, a toll booth on a motorway. You've got lots coming, coming in. Um, and then there's like a bit of a junction there and some come out. So that's basically what your AV node does. It'll slow down the, um, the, the amount that comes through. So it's a, it's a regular fast rhythm rather than a chaotic, irregular fast rhythm. Um, that's basically the difference. The symptoms are generally the same, the causes are generally the same, um, the diagnosis treatments you know, are, are generally the same. So that there's not that much difference. I, I would say the main difference is on the, on the ECG. However, when you're getting down to electrophysiological level, I'm sure there's a, there's a lot of difference that's um, out of my expertise. Thanks, John. That's a great analogy with the talk world. Um, and another question is, does missing a heartbeat often and for a while constitute AF? Is that for me? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, did you want to answer that, Professor Gale? I just heard you. <laughs> no. Go for it, John. No, uh, it's, um, no it, it, it doesn't. I think the important thing is that um, you're feeling something that's abnormal to, to yourself. So um, the fact that, um, you know, the fact that you, you, something is feeling different to you does mean that you probably do need to get that checked out, have a discussion with your GP. The most difficult part when you think you've got, um, you know, palpitations or there's something not quite right with your heart rate is trying to capture exactly what's going on at the time. So um, that, that, that's the most you know difficult part at the beginning obviously if these heartbeats you know if you're missing a lot or you're feeling symptomatic with it we would certainly say you know you need to get to a and &E or form 111 not just to see what's going on um but th there are lots of different rhythm problems that um you know can present themselves in different ways again a couple a couple more questions before we, we close for today at what heart at what speed heart rate should you go to hospital and how long should you wait is who's that? any of us? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, the, the issue here is not necessarily the upper limit of the heart rate, which there are there are levels. Uh, 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 it's how well you feel as uh, as well, because if you're feeling poorly, you should be going to hospital. Okay, uh, and so it's not just the upper limit; it's the lower limit, as I explained earlier. Sometimes the heartbeat can actually go really quite slowly, and you can feel dizzy or blackout or collapse. That that would necessarily mean you need to go to hospital. Equally, sometimes the heartbeat can really go quite fast, um, you know, 180, that sort of beats uh, up, up to the maximum heartbeat. Um, now, mo sometimes we can tolerate that, but usually we can't tolerate it for very for, for too long a period of time and you will get symptoms. Um, so it's a little bit like, I tend to say it's a little bit like running a marathon every day, all day. You'll get fatigued and tired uh, and, and not just personally, but your heart will as well. And so when you get certainly high heart rates, if you're getting symptoms, it's probably worth going to hospital. 
Now, if you are one of those patients that is getting paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and you're familiar with your symptoms, I tend to say, unless you're feeling poorly or it's particularly protracted, so lasting a long period of time, there's no point going to hospital because inevitably what happens is you, you pitch up to A&E, you wait there for several hours, and by the time someone does an ECG, the heartbeat is back to normal. Um, so it can just flip back. And, and, but patients who are familiar with their paroxysmal atrial fibrillation will be, will, will be very used to that scenario. Thanks, Chris. And one, one last question. Um, to you, Professor Gale, why has my second ablation only lasted three months? What causes AF to come back? Yeah, great question. Uh, and, and again, you know, uh, um, and this is sometimes it, it's just leveling the expectations of what we can and can't do. Um, we, we do know that uh, ablation therapy can help with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It, it's certainly not as effective as the ablation therapy for other atrial heart rhythm disorders where there's a particular tight focus or a little pathway that we can burn or freeze. Uh, um, the, the atrial fibrillation um, surgery is notoriously not as effective. And I tend to say to patients that after two ablations, there still isn't a perfect success rate for everybody. Probably seven out of 10 people will find a benefit. And I think Mike actually um, mentioned in his, his, his journey that he had had, was it five ablations? And, and, and therein lies the, uh, the evidence um, that atrial fibrillation and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation really can be quite frustrating <laughs> for the physician and for the patient. Why? Um, because um, the pathway, the focus can vary in different areas. And the, and, and the way we burn it cannot always be perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, over to you, Fergus, so to close the event. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Leanne, for hosting uh, the question and answer session. Of course, thank you to Joanne for answering the questions, for Chris too, for answering the questions and for his presentation, and of course, to Mike for his presentation as well. And of course, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. And we hope you've enjoyed hearing from our brilliant speakers and how your support helps us to fund groundbreaking research. Now, could I just return to the poll? Uh, so how would you rate your understanding of atrial fibrillation now? And, and of course, the answer is from one to five. If you could uh, indicate one as being lesser and five as being greater. And I think the result as it did earlier on will come up uh, pretty much live. Yes, there, four, very good, 63%. Brilliant. Now, um, if we haven't managed to answer your question in this session, we encourage you again to visit our dedicated heart helpline if you'd like to speak to one of our clinical team about your query. Um, we'd be keen to get your feedback and suggestions by completing the survey that will be sent via email as it will help shape future events. And if, if you'd be particularly inspired by our work on atrial fibrillation, all donations to support our cause and vital research are very much appreciated. And there's a link to donate should viewers wish to do so at the end of the event. A reminder, uh, this event was recorded and will be available on our website from next week. Our next live and ticking event will take place on the 27th, that's the 27th of July, on the topic of bypass surgery. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. And goodbye.